Last time we were discussing the, the topic uh, about uh, globalization, that what is the impact of globalization and uh, possible advantages and disadvantages. And we also discussed the topic about uh, digital divide. What is digital divide and uh, what are the reasons that we have this digital divide. So mainly, mainly we discussed that uh, uh, the, the access uh, to the infrastructure, access to the technology is based on some wealth. If you are rich, if you are wealthy, you have more access to uh, uh, infrastructure and uh, technologies. Uh, but at the same time, some other actually have uh, other view that it is not about only haves and uh, have-nots, but it is about society. It's, there are some other social factors that contribute to digital divides, like a case study uh, given in the chapter uh, of uh, there was uh, one company, one organization who actually uh, <coughs> In Ireland, they actually invited, they are actually uh, got the, the <coughs> intention of the, the, the people who are living in that uh, village to automate that village. And uh, then uh, once it was actually automated, uh, there was, I mean, the, the key observation was like, people are not willing to use the technology, they are not actually. Uh, using the, the facility that is through the technology but they actually prefer the social gatherings they actually uh, like one example is uh, those who are unemployed they, they, they physically I mean before the automation of that system they physically go to the uh, some specific office to collect their uh, stipend and then at the, at the same place they have uh, the, the gathering, the social gathering, they, inter, they interact with each other. After the automation, they actually uh, don't need to go to that office, but they, they can apply through, through the site, through the website, and they can get the stipend, but they prefer to go to, to the, that specific office for the social security. So it means like uh, if we, we say that if someone has the technology, then uh, that there is no digital divide. But, but we, we, we say that this, uh, there are some other social factors that contribute to that uh, digital divide. Now, the, 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 the last topic of this chapter is the winner takes all society. Winner take all is actually the, the, the concept that when someone wins in the competition, lot of prizes are there for that specific winner but those who are actually unable to 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 compete are even I mean they are in the competition but they they are not like as capable of that winner so for those people there is very little as a as a reward for for that competition so now we are living in such kind of society due to this advancement in technology and due to this uh, globalization that uh, we may say that we are living in the, the winner take all society. Winner take all society in if uh, again uh, we may say that uh, the top performers, people with a very good skill set, uh, they are not, I mean they are just few percent of the whole population. So they, they are getting a lot of reward for that, that skill set, for that, that that performance. So the main reasons are, are like uh, again the, the better infrastructure, we have uh, better systems. So due to that better systems we, we are actually uh, having this kind of competition like uh, last time we discussed that like, someone living in US and someone living in uh, some other part of the world they have the equal opportunity for the jobs I mean they at least they can compete okay. so the efficient transportation systems IT systems and uh, network economies like what we said now the, the market is open and you can actually access to to the all parts of the world so in that case that is the reason I mean uh, that that actually leads to to this kind of environment 
Another important reason is actually uh, the dominance of English language. There are just 12 countries in the world where the native language is English. But English, we know that that is the dominant language in the world. So that is an other, I mean, the possible reason if someone has like with this skill set, I mean the soft skill sets, they are, I mean, more I preferred as compared to someone who has no such kind of skills. Then the changing business norms, we discussed like uh, organizations have formal hierarchies, but uh, now due to communication means that are cheaper, that are, I mean, easy for uh, communication. So uh, we have the different kind of business norms that, that are changed as compared to the, the, the one that we have in the past. So that again, uh, you know, motivate people to, t in, the, in this direction. Like I, I just take this example uh, in Pakistan, and cricket is very popular. I mean the sports. So, lot of young people in Pakistan they are more inclined towards uh, cricket because they they know that there there are a lot of reward for the the top performers of the cricket. But some in some like in in uh, in case of hockey that is our national game. So there, there are no rewards or very little reward. So people are not motivated to, to actually compete for, for, for that kind of sports. They are interested in the, in the activities that they feel that they have high reward. But again, when everyone is going for the same, same kind of uh, activity, then the high competition only again, I mean, this leads to the, to that, uh, the, the winners take all uh, phenomena because the top performers get the rewards but a lot of others actually are not getting uh, what is actually what, what they deserve. So just see this, this figure in, in uh, I mean in 80s like uh, the top management of the organization they have not like uh, they are not really uh, very highly paid and uh, if we compare it like today's uh, business or job market, uh, the top management of the organization, I mean the, mainly the IT organization, they are, they are doing really big business. So their top position holders are getting too much as compared to the, the lower staff, the, the, the workers. Their pay is not really increased in, in those uh, like 40, 50 years time. But the, the, the salaries and the packages of the, the top position holders in the organizations, they are they are actually the take call position holders. Okay, here is the comparison and this is quite interesting compar comparison of two sportsmen. And one, I mean, both have like uh, more or less the same numbers uh, in, in, uh, in some specific sport like, but uh, someone with the, the be better ranking, someone with the like, uh, uh, better performance in journal uh, you know we we have the the ranking in the in the sports so the top ranked are paid more as compared to the lower ranks uh, quite possible the lower uh, lower ranked uh, players are equally good as compared to the the top ranked but uh, once you are like top ranked then uh, your rewards are uh, exponentially high as compared to the one, those who are low, low rank. Okay, now the question is how to reduce this winner take all effects. So, uh, one way, one possibility is to actually to reduce this competition. So, you can actually reduce the business hours. If, like in Pakistan, uh, we, I mean, uh, we observe the shopkeepers in, 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 in one specific market. If uh, some are open till 12 o'clock, so others who are actually not willing to, 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 to work for so, so, so long. But because others are actually available, others are actually open for the business, so they are also bound somehow to actually open their shops. So if we impose the, the, the business hours, we have uh, kind of uh, 
such kind of regulations that okay for that specific time period uh, you can open the the shops open the markets then obviously I mean uh, th that is like uh, we are reducing the competition we we are actually controlling that kind of situation another possibility is to actually have some kind of you know is uh, uh, to reduce this competition if we have some structure we have some you know is uh, like uh, the range of uh, you know the, the rewards uh, the we define the categories that okay in some specific category we we I mean we have to actually to 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 minimize this difference that is uh, in terms of rewards so like uh, one one another example like progressive tax structures those who are actually earning more those who are getting more they have to pay more so if we know that if we are doing lot of effort if we are if we are earning lot of money but at the same time we have to pay lot i mean in in taxes there will be the 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 tax reduction will be increased as our salary increases so in in that way we are actually going to uh, minimize this competition that is another possibility and obviously we have to come up with some you know the the reforms in terms of finances that can actually control this competition so uh, that's all for this chapter and this chapter was about uh, uh, automation and globalization and what are the impacts of this uh, imp uh, uh, and what are the impacts of this globalization and automation? In chapter number six, we will discuss the, the privacy and the, the rules and regulations of uh, government, uh, particularly the US government uh, in, the, in our context in this chapter. The, most of the cont is, content is related to the US uh, regulations to actually protect or uh, to compromise the privacy. So in this chapter, we will uh, discuss U.S. legislation and uh, then what are the possible relevant activities related to privacy and uh, what are the policies of the, the U.S. government for the private sector, for the public sector, what, what are the uh, different prominent uh, acts that are passed by the U.S. government and uh, what is the uh, concept of data mining and why the government is uh, using data mining and how it is, I mean, uh, how it is threat to the, the privacy of the individuals. And then uh, we will discuss the possibilities of national identification card, information dissemination, dissemination and in information invasion. So these are the, the topics that we will discuss in this chapter. Okay, uh, we discussed the, the concept of privacy. Privacy is like uh, uh, we have some, some sort of boundary of our, you know, the personal liberty and uh, you, you may say the zone of uh, inaccessibility. Every person needs some kind of privacy. We discussed the advantages and disadvantages of privacy. Yes, uh, certainly there are some uh, advantages we we need some uh, sort of private privacy and uh, but uh, law of privacy there are possible disadvantages that we discuss like uh, people who are in uh, isolation and then uh, we discuss that how it impact on our social life or our family life so we need actually some sort of balance uh, when we are actually protecting the privacy and at the same time we are actually we want to protect our individuals so uh, you know there are different level of governments like uh, in, in even in Pakistan we have federal government then we have provincial governments then we have uh, local governments the same way in US they have the federal state and local governments and they I mean all these you know the different uh, players the three different players they they may have their own rules and regulations so 
we need to actually find out the balance uh, what is the balance i mean we have the desire to be left alone we we need privacy we have our personal stuff we have our personal life personal time but at the same time we have desire to be secure to be safe so uh, it's actually the task of the governments that how they actually manage it so in a particularly in us after the 911 attacks uh, they they were more i mean concerned about the the national security so uh, we will discuss it okay if we if we talk about the activities that are related to privacy there are actually the four types of uh, uh, activities uh, one is information collection obviously what does it mean mm, to gather the information so that information is uh, about individuals about groups so so the gathering of personal information is actually information collection we know that different public and private institutes and organizations they 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 actually gather uh, such kind of information for different reasons and sometimes we voluntarily and uh, some other times involuntarily we actually provide this information Another category of uh, privacy activities uh, is about information processing and we understand, uh, I mean being IT students, we, everyone knows that uh, once we have the information, once we have the data, we can actually process it, we can infer the meanings, we can find out the patterns, we, I mean we can manipulate this, uh, this information in different ways. The third category is information dissemination. Dissemination is obviously the distribution of the information. Again, it depends like uh, uh, with what intention that information is distribu distributed. When we are actually giving our information to some organization and uh, we actually have the assumption that this, is, th this information will not be shared with, the, with other organizations, with the third parties, but sometimes uh, the organization, the, the, the source organizations share that information with, with other parties, with other organizations for different reasons. Sometimes those reasons are actually the uh, solely commercial reasons. Uh, invasion, invasion again, the, when there is some you know, intrusion as uh, activities that are related to the, the, the privacy compromise when the people are actually uh, I mean uh, interrupted through that information that is uh, that is actually invasion so there are diff again uh, sometimes the state offices sometimes the the public institutions they actually invade our information and sometimes the private organizations are the people with the malintention like hackers they they invade our privacy and the information Okay, this, I mean, uh, now the, our discussion is about uh, U.S. legislation regarding the information collection. What kind of, what type of information is collected by the, uh, the organizations? I mean, those organizations, either public or private. Okay, the first act that we are going to discuss is Imply Polygraph Protection Act. Uh, that was passed in 1988. Uh, the polygraph is actually the test to detect the lie. The, you know it's, it's quite uh, common in some countries. But in US they actually prohibited uh, the private organization that if they are hiring people for their organization they, they actually they, they cannot conduct uh, this, this kind of test. So so this this uh, uh, I mean this act actually stops the organization that, that previously were actually practicing to conduct this test. So again like uh, there are exceptions. Exceptions are like pharmaceutical companies and the security firms and uh, again they cannot actually conduct this test for every employee but some special jobs for some special jobs they are allowed to, to conduct this test. Similarly, like uh, some, 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 uh, some, some certain jobs, like uh, that kind of, uh, you know, the top level jobs, they may actually 
uh, have the requirement to conduct this test and uh, obviously that is for you know the private organization the, uh, the federal or the other you know the public sector institution they, they were actually exempted through this act. Another act that was passed in US uh, was about uh, collection of information from children children those are under 13 so first thing is like to get the minimum information from the children I mean only the information that is really required and uh, secondly if there are I mean uh, the services that need the information of the children uh, you need the consent of the parents or you, you, you may ask the parents to, to actually provide the information, the children, those who are under 12. So their parents are actually uh, responsible to provide any information if, if it is required by some service provider. So this is another way to actually uh, protect the privacy of the, the individuals, particularly the children. Another interesting act that was passed in uh, US to protect the privacy of individual is uh, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. In discrimination on the basis of genetics, some like uh, in mostly in, in case of health insurance. Companies are more interested that if you have some diseases uh, like uh, that are inherited. So maybe they have some kind of test that are genetic test. So U.S. actually, I mean, the, the, the government passed the, the bill, the, the act that they uh, accompany these, I mean, these kind of companies are not actually allowed to, 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 to ask for this, this kind of information that is related to genetics. So uh, again, there are exemptions, not, I mean, uh, in every act, there, <laughs> there are some ex exemptions. So, there are exceptions, there are exceptions, but again, uh, in journal, employer cannot take that uh, genetic information even for like promotion, for, uh, for firing, mm, for hiring. So, small companies that are like, uh, their, their staff size is less than 15, uh, 15 members, they, they, they were exempted. Okay, what kind of information is collected by the government? Uh, when we say the government here, in, in, in this context, it's about the U.S. government. And obviously, in every country, uh, different, I mean, kind of information is collected by every government. So, one popular, very, very common, you know, the, the information gathering source is actually, or the way is actually census. You know, in, in even in Pakistan, it's by by constitution, it's it's uh, state's responsibility, government's responsibility to to, to conduct uh, this kind of activity uh, after every ten years' time. So in in U.S., uh, they have uh, this practice for for quite long time. I mean, uh, uh, in perhaps in 1840, they they conducted uh, uh, they they did census for the first time. And then it is, so you know, it's a, it's a continuous process. So they are actually uh, improving and they are actually, I mean, the, the set of questions they ask from the people, they, from their people, they, that, that is different uh, from time to time. So they, in fact, they are actually getting more information. They are more, uh, I mean, uh, uh, more, uh, what we call it, more familiar with the, with the uh, with the with their population by by those uh, questionnaires so uh, when it was conducted first time it was just six questions and those questions were very basic questions but with the passage of time now they have uh, uh, i mean lengthy questionnaires they uh, just post those questionnaires to the the, the people and they answer at their uh, own at their own convenience, and uh, then they also have this uh, activity. Uh, I mean, when they f do this physically. So uh, now the question is, 
either we are use that uh, information only for the the planning purposes i mean the projects that are initiated by the the government or we are misusing this information so uh, they actually use this information i mean the us government in in first world war uh, to actually hire to to recruit the people for for their uh, military and in second world war they actually use uh, they use this information their census information the, the, the census data for uh, pointing out for actually identifying the japanese who were living in uh, in us and uh, that's that's actually the misuse of uh, that information obviously by i mean that's that's uh, by choice so this 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 image is just of uh, uh, that second world war when they actually identified the japanese and they actually moving to moving them to camps and other possibility of gathering the information is the internal revenue service that is to actually uh, that is about the taxes taxes return that's when the people actually uh, give the information when they pay taxes so the the, the department that deals with this uh, taxes uh, that actually do the audit that is internal review service and they try to actually uh, they, they actually search for the the, the possible fraud cases they the people who actually pay low low taxes are they actually hide their income so they have access to the lot of information and that personal information is actually uh, i mean uh, obviously is uh, again uh, is uh, if it is misused that that is a compromise on privacy FBI National Crime Information Center and uh, that center was actually the initiated that was established to have some database okay the related to the criminal activities and uh, I mean uh, when it was started uh, there was not like too much information but with the passage of time is uh, like uh, millions of records that uh, that uh, that database has but uh, again it's a lot of information that uh, that can help the government to identify the possible uh, illegal or uh, the kind of uh, terrorist activities but at the same time that information may be misused and uh, there are i mean uh, the possibilities that uh, uh, some people who are not actually involved but due to you know we will discuss that due to the problem with the data entry due to the errors in the data some other people who are not involved those kind of activities they can also be actually they can also suffer from that uh, that data so there are some some success stories uh, but there are some failures when they actually like false positive and false negative someone is criminal but that is not identified and someone is innocent and that is identified as criminal then there there was another you know uh, is attempt to uh, gather the information through one DOJ database DOJ stands for the Department of Justice so their Department of Justice decided to have one central database where they have the information about the such kind of uh, activities and then that uh, i mean that information can be used by the the, the police department to locate the criminals and uh, obviously i mean uh, long term for long term usage so again that information is a huge information and uh, i mean if there are people who are actually have mal intentions and they are corrupt uh, they they may have been uh, in police department or some other departments they they can actually uh, misuse that information but you know the the very i mean uh, prominent is drawback of this database is like uh, there is no way to actually correct the misinformation the, the, the again the data entry errors if uh, i mean this is like uh, uh, the real problem that you are actually 
quite possible that out of 100 there is one innocent that is not actually involved in the criminal activities but they, they, they I mean he or she can suffer. Closed circuit television cameras. Now it is very, very common. I mean, uh, we have security cameras, what I said in previous lecture, that even we have cameras in classrooms. So that was with the purpose to have uh, more security, to uh, secure our people. But again, uh, I mean, what are the, the possible uh, return on investment in this case. Uh, the studies say that the, the investment is huge when we use this kind of uh, infrastructure to secure the people, but uh, the effectiveness of uh, this system is very less. Uh, the, I mean, there, there is big question mark on the effectiveness, effectiveness of the system. So still, you see, 200 million dollar for 3,000 new cameras in, in, in just one city. So that is like, uh, and again, if you, 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 you have such kind of cameras, then again, like here, you, you, you need the, the, the readers that can actually read your license plate, your vehicle number plate, and obviously you have some specific uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, material and the, the template or the format, and then it's again, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's actually costly process. So it is a, again, I mean, it is uh, this uh, closed circuit system is uh, not really very effective, but yes, like this one, uh, maybe out of millions of images, you may detect some, some kind of uh, illegal activity, some kind of, uh, you know, is uh, kind of uh, attack that is going to happen. So it's little possibility, but still there are success stories that uh, how this uh, system actually helped. Another, you know, is a uh, way to collect the information is uh, the usage of drones, D drones used by the police. So in, in, in US, they, I mean, in different states, police have the uh, the drones and they, they, they can use it like for some specific height and then uh, there uh, you know uh, there was debate that okay uh, it's, it's, it's a kind of compromise on the privacy of individuals and the why it's like uh, it should be uh, before I mean before using this drone by the police they, they should actually ask for the warrant they, they, they get the permission from the court and then they can actually use it. So uh, the public opinion is yes, peop, I mean uh, drone can be used by the police to, to, to search something, to some item, some person, but again, uh, maybe for some rescue operation. Uh, but at the same time, it, it, it shouldn't be, I mean, uh, like in this case, they, uh, to, if, you, if you are monitoring the, the vehicle speed, the car speeds through the drones, then it is uh, not something uh, appropriate. So, again, the mix of opinion that uh, we, we can use drones or police can use the drone, but with some uh, rules and regulations. This is just the image of Okay, now the topic is like uh, when the government actually gather the information or government do the surveillance without informing the people that is called covert government surveillance okay that is very important the fourth amendment to the u.s constitution uh, it's actually uh, provides the right to the citizens to the individuals that they are secure they have the privacy and no one actually can uh, search and can access uh, uh, their their belongings without any you know is uh, just like uh, some some solid reason so if they they like here probable cause so if they have some solid reason then they have to actually I mean in in whatever is the security agency like police they have to ask the court they they need to get the warrant and then they can actually have the access so that is actually the 
kind of uh, constitutional protection of uh, individuals. But what happens when the uh, security agencies, I mean the, the, the government uh, security agencies, they, they do the surveillance without informing the people, without informing the citizens like their wire wiretaps wire what, what is wiretap wiretapping is actually the mechanism when you intercept the call so uh, obviously you are not actually informing the callers I mean those who are actually uh, communicating without informing at the both ends you are actually intercepting the call and obviously uh, the agencies do it for some national security purpose uh, so this is one way and bug is in in this context bug is uh, you know the hidden microphone that is installed somewhere to actually listen to someone's conversation so these are the two possibilities that actually uh, that is used to get the information to gather the information but again I mean wiretapping is quite old you know the concept is uh, is old technique to to, to gather the information and uh, we we are also familiar with this uh, I mean we have uh, we have heard different stories that how the government agencies use uh, this technique to gather the information but in again in US there are different you know the, the court cases there are different case studies in some cases uh, the the court decision is in the favor of individual that okay state or agency has no right to actually uh, to intercept but in some other cases they have I, I mean it's, it's, it's it, it varies from case to case in some cases court says it's okay to actually do this activity but in other cases they say no it, it, it should be stopped so it depends on the scenario that okay another you know is uh, major kind of uh, surveillance activity without informing individuals with, without informing the uh, society that was called operation shamrock shamrock operation was actually in, uh, in in the time of second world war in 40s when they actually us actually decided uh, that okay their agencies can actually intercept all the international telegrams whatever the communication is uh, from outside US they can actually monitor that that communication so in that case they may have like uh, yes they, they can they can figure out there is a possibility to 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 identify those individuals or the groups that are involved maybe that that is the threat I mean activities that are threat to the the US security but at the same time it's uh, it's like uh, it's not fair for everyone even like in within US uh, the the people who who were against the like uh, Vietnam war uh, those those protesters are actually also identified as a threat to the US security so that's that's actually something that is uh, again I mean there is always some pros and cons of uh, every regulation or every 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 you know the step that is taken by the government so in 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 every case we cannot say that this act or this policy or this the, the way to deal with the the the, the national security that is uh, all okay here is another you know is uh, uh, surveillance system by the US agencies uh, when I mean when the PC was common when the PC was popular internet is common so uh, they started to actually uh, monitor the traffic on the internet and they they have the access to you know to, to emails and to other communications and uh, again it is like uh, they have some success stories they may identify some uh, possible uh, you know activities that are kind of illegal or that are threat to uh, national security but uh, again it's compromise on the privacy of individuals after 9-11 they I mean the, the, the US government was more sensitive to uh, about the the national security so they actually allowed to uh, their national you know security agencies to 
to actually monitor the, the traffic, whatever is, I mean, the important in their context, or whatever importance to them, they, they can intercept. Okay, here is the, you know, some numbers that uh, after that uh, policy, that after 9-11 attack, they, they can intercept information. So, you just see that the people within, within U.S., there are about 5,000 or uh, 500 peoples uh, within U.S. and, and uh, 5,000 to 7,000 people outside the U.S. They were monitored and they, they just, I mean, uh, they, their success stories are there that they actually identified some terrorist activities and they actually stopped, uh, uh, they actually, uh, you know, it's, they actually filed it. But uh, at the same time, uh, again, a lot of, uh, you know, people that are not actually concerned or that are not directly, you know, involved in, in, uh, in, in those kind of activities, but still they are under, under you know, observation. Uh, because they have access to, to, to those uh, information. I mean, the agencies have the access to, to the information of that individual. Another, you know, uh, we, we are actually discussing that uh, how the information of individuals, of the people is collected by the government. There, there are different possibilities. Then, Okay, how that information is manipulated, how that information is used, that is an other, you know, is the category of, uh, I mean, uh, privacy related activities. So, Department of Justice have their own database for the help of police and the Department of Defense in 2003, they, they, they proposed a law database that, okay, it is like uh, whatever are the malicious activities that should be recorded, that should be uh, available to other, you know, like uh, uh, agencies and then they actually uh, use that uh, information to, to, to detect the activities that are actually unwanted activities. So th there are different, I mean, uh, uh, intentions by the different departments to gather the information of individuals, either they are living in the U.S. or outside the U.S. I mean, if they feel that they, someone outside the U.S. is threat to the security of uh, U.S. people, they, they actually observe, they actually monitor those organizations, those individuals, and uh, they have the different means to actually do it. Okay, the next topic is like, uh, w we, we discussed the wiretapping is the way to intercept the calls, but at different times, courts decide about this activity as a legal activity, as allowed activity or not allowed activity. But there are some U U U.S. legislation for authorizing the, the wiretapping. We, we discussed like uh, there are different, I mean at, di at different times there are different uh, events and due to those events uh, the governments allow their agencies to, to, to do this, this kind of activities. Like, uh, in, in this is like, uh, you know, it's quite old uh, legislation with, uh, with the Title III. In, in 60s and 70s, they actually allowed that, okay, whatever is the communication by telephones, they, they can actually uh, gather, they, they can actually intercept, and uh, if, I mean, they have uh, some solid reasons, and they, they, they can do it for 30 days. And then again, you know, it's uh, their, their Supreme Court, their Supreme Court actually uh, rejected this idea that, okay, even on, I mean, on, uh, with, with this uh, national security agenda, you, you cannot actually uh, do this activity. But yes, they have this law, this have this, 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 this regulation that uh, they allowed their, their police and agencies to, to, to do the wiretapping. Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. This is another, you know, you, you, you understand that this, I mean, through this act, again, agencies are, the, the, 
that are related to the national security, they are allowed to actually monitor the foreign nationals and they can actually do their electronic surveillance up to one year time. So, and, and they even don't need the, the court order, they don't need the, actually the permission and they, they can do it and we know even, I mean it's, it's like a kind of open secret that the US government, US uh, security agencies and intelligence agencies are involved to actually uh, do this kind of activities with other, within, I mean outside the US uh, for, for other the governments, uh, governments of other countries, they, it's, it's quite common. Here is another very important, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of activity that is done by the, the, the U.S. Uh, security agencies, intelligence agencies. They, uh, this is called PRISM program. In this program, they, I mean, this was actually revealed by the Edward Snowden that the uh, U.S. intelligence agencies have uh, access to the information uh, that is available on Microsoft, Yahoo, Google servers. I mean, the, obviously, uh, uh, their users are uh, around the globe, and uh, that information is uh, not only uh, uh, relevant or only related to the uh, the U.S. or the people living in the U.S., but all I mean, all uh, over the all over the world, uh, the users. Uh, I mean, the users of these companies are actually having information on their servers. So they were actually uh, have access to, the, uh, to those servers. And th th this is actually the big compromise. Uh, in, in other words, there is no actually privacy of individuals. So then actually they, I mean, uh, once it was actually revealed, then uh, US government actually denied it. That they, no, they, and, and the companies also said that no, they, they don't have uh, such kind of information. They, they actually don't have such kind of agreement with the uh, US government or the US intelligence agencies. So that's all for today. We will continue in the next lecture.